Right now at six, the front range is growing quickly. We're going to be 260,000 plus people by the year 2060. And Mother Nature can hardly keep up. We've had our um, source water intake on the Poudre River turned off for about 40 days this summer period. As the western United States endures extreme drought, Front Range cities are looking at new water sources. This adds a different type of water asset to our portfolio. It's drought proof. It's reliable. But new resources could come with new problems. It's no small amount of uranium. It exceeds the Safe Drinking Water Act. Tonight, we have in-depth coverage. Good evening and thank you for watching Denver 7 News at 6. I'm Ann Trujillo. And I'm Shannon Ogden. The Western United States is drying up. And that's prompting cities all along the Front Range to act now to ensure we have water in the future. Now, I want you to take a look at this latest drought monitor of the Western US, just released today. It shows extreme drought across much of the West. Now, those conditions stretch into Northwestern Colorado as well. This is having an effect on the Colorado River is causing a domino effect throughout the southwestern U.S. The Colorado River starts in Rocky Mountain National Park where it falls as snow. The river runs through Utah, Arizona and into Nevada where it flows into Lake Mead. 40 million people in these seven states, including Colorado, rely on the Colorado River for their water. But this is where the main problems lie. Drought is causing Lake Mead to sink, in fact, to unprecedented levels. Just last week, U.S. officials declared the first ever water shortage on the Colorado around Lake Mead. So how does a reservoir nearly 800 miles away impact us here in Colorado? Well, for one, water restrictions could go into effect in our state to preserve water for the rest of the West. And these conditions are forcing local municipalities to look at other sources of water. Denver 7's Russell Haythorn takes us to fast-growing Greeley, where city leaders are thinking about the future. Like most front-range communities, traffic you know is crazy Greeley is experiencing tremendous growth here in Greeley we're like steady Eddie at two and a half to three and a half percent year in and year out almost regardless of what the economic condition is today the city's population stands at 111,000 people based on census data state demographer projections we're going to be 260,000 plus people by the year 2060. Because of that, planners like Water and Sewer Director Sean Chambers are looking ahead, especially when it comes to water. And the reality is we have to have a diverse supply. Greeley is already well positioned with lots of surface water. It's one of the largest shareholders of Colorado Big Thompson water rights with more than 20,000 acre feet. But much of Greeley's watershed sits in areas recently scorched by wildfire. 50% of Greeley's supply is impacted by the East Troublesome burn scar. Then you get debris and tremendous sediment and ash. On top of that, another 30% of Greeley's watershed is in the Cameron Peak burn scar. We've had our um, source water intake on the Poudre River turned off for about 40 days this summer period wow. because the water quality was too poor to treat. Because of those issues, and a reservoir expansion project that stalled out, Greeley is further diversifying, recently acquiring an underground aquifer called the Terry Ranch Project near the Wyoming border. This adds a different type of water asset to our portfolio. It's drought proof, it's reliable. But the aquifer is not without its critics. I have great uh, concern that they will not be able to recharge it when it's empty. Mm. It's a one-time use. John Guthrie is Greeley's former chief water engineer and founded Save Greeley's Water, which also has grave concerns about uranium in the aquifer. And it's no small amount of uranium. It exceeds the Safe Drinking Water Act. Chambers says the water can be treated. The science absolutely proves that the uranium can be treated. Those who are saying it's undrinkable are ignoring the science. And he believes Greeley's plan is right on track. Absolutely. In Greeley. Our planning horizon is really about 50 years out to make sure that we're well prepared when that day comes. Russell Haythorn, Denver 7. And the water fight isn't isolated to Greeley. Most cities along Colorado's Front Range have water challenges. And for some context here, let's take a look at Thornton. The city bought water rights from farmers in northern Colorado years ago. But the city's plan to build a 72-mile pipeline from north of Fort Collins to Thornton is tied up in the courts. Larimer County is fighting with Thornton over the pipeline's location. And of course, these water problems didn't just happen overnight, and it could be here for a while. Meteorologist Stacey Donaldson joins us now to uh, give us some insight here. 
And the West really, Stacy, has been in a drought for a couple of decades now. It has, and we're really seeing the effects here um, in person over the, just the last couple of years with the drought and the dry weather that has moved into the western half of the United States. This is Lake Oroville in California. From June 2019, you can see the real change here from July to 2021, where things have really dried up across the area. And the same for Shasta Lake in California. As we've gone through the last couple of years, it has dried out with the drought for the western U.S. And here for Lake Powell, the red line is the same here for 2020 and 2021, but the water level dropped by 30 feet. So the climate change connection is not just affecting heat waves and droughts. It's increased tropical activity, shrinking Arctic ice and record setting wildfires. And we're definitely seeing that as we've seen the top 10 hottest years all since 2005 here for the area. Western wildfires fire frequency also going up as our temperatures have gone up and we're also experiencing more smoke here for Colorado and the western U.S. as these fires burn out to our west as things dry out and we're going to be talking more about this smoke that will be affecting us even as we go into this weekend coming up in a few minutes. All right thank you Stacy. Now we'd like to hear from you on this. How do you think Colorado should address water shortage because of this drought? Any ideas? We'd love to hear them. 360 at the denverchannel.com. We have some breaking news right now. US 285 is closed in both directions near Conifer because of a deadly crash. It appears two pickup trucks collided. We know at least one person died. At least three others were airlifted to the hospital and still no word on when 285 will reopen. Members of Colorado's congressional delegation are weighing tonight on the bombings in Afghanistan that killed at least 13 now US service members. Congressman Jason Crow, who served in Afghanistan as an Army Ranger, says we need to focus on getting Americans out of that country unharmed. The mission is not over until we get American citizens out and we get our partners out. Uh, that, that is the, the, the new mission. We ended our combat operations. We ended the 20-year war. But now we have a new mission in the next days and weeks ahead, and that is to make sure we don't leave people behind. The United States of America should not and must not leave anyone behind. Congressman Ed Perlmutter shared his condolences to the families, saying, I'm grateful for the men and women on the ground who continue to put themselves in harm's way as we work to complete this mission. Also, we heard from Congressman Doug Lamborn, who called this a tragic and horrific day. His quote, I know I speak for many of my constituents when I say that outrage does not even begin to describe my reaction. School has been in session for just a few weeks here in Colorado. We're already seeing outbreaks statewide. There are 14 outbreaks in schools in our state, most in districts not requiring masks. Denver 7's Gary Broad shows us where those outbreaks are happening and what the school districts are saying about them. Around the state, we saw 144 cases of COVID between students and staff from elementary school all the way up to high school. From Montrose all the way to Adams, schools in eight different counties dealing with outbreaks, according to CDPHE's website. Keep in mind, an outbreak is five or more cases. As we head west, Mesa County saw the most cases with 30 in a total of four schools. Their neighbors Montrose, as well as El Paso and Dugco, not too far behind. As we head east to Dugco, they had 28 cases between four schools. Two of those schools had four staff members test positive for COVID. Douglas County tells us as of August 23rd, it's requiring all students in preschool through sixth grade to wear masks indoors. Staying in the Denver Metro, Adams, Arapahoe, and Jeffco all had an outbreak at one school. A spokesperson for Adams 27J tells us as soon as they are close to an outbreak, they notify families and staff who may have been exposed. They also prepare the teacher and school to roll that class to remote learning. El Paso had 27 cases, four of which were staff, the rest students in elementary and middle schools. And as we head back out west over to Montrose County, one of their elementary schools had 26 cases, 24 of which were students. Montrose, El Paso, and Mesa counties do not require masks. They had some of the highest case rates. Reporting for Denver 7, I'm Gary Broad. The principal and athletic director both at Chatfield High School in Littleton have been placed on administrative leave. Jeffco Schools says Principal Chad Brower and Athletic Director Craig Auckland are on leave due to allegations of failing to follow district safety protocols. Now, the district wouldn't clarify just what that means. Former Principal Jim Ellis is returning in the interim. The district is still working to find an interim AD. Two young boys are safe at home in Greeley tonight after a frightening incident this morning. Their mother strapped them into their car seats and then ran back inside to grab something. Along with her husband, she explains what happened next. We were out the door in like less than a minute and the car was gone and we were just looking at each other like 
one on earth. Thankfully, the boys were dropped off by whoever stole the car and they were found unharmed by police. And right now, police don't know who stole the car. The iconic Sports Castle building at 10th and Broadway in downtown Denver has been sold and will soon be redeveloped. Plans include for it turning it into a mixed use development with retail stores on the ground level and office space on the upper levels. Construction is not likely to begin until 2023. And the construction company that bought the building plans to place it on the National Register of Historic Places. He says he'll keep the historic integrity of the building during redevelopment. And there's a lot of history in that building. Now, the building was constructed as a Chrysler dealership back in 1926. Then in the 70s, it turned into what we all know as the Sports Castle. Gart Brothers opened the building, making it the first big box specialty concept store in all of North America. And then it stayed Gart Brothers until 1993 when Sports Authority bought it. The building has been left vacant since Sports Authority went bankrupt in 2016. I looked up at God and I said, really? I said, really? I said, like now, Chloe, too? Lost and with nowhere to turn, a woman turns to Facebook to save her dog. She said, I'm calling the vet right now. She says, I will take care of all the bills. Just as she was losing hope, her social media angel stepped in to help. I can't believe that this type of kindness exists in the world.